Einstein was just working with the equations and he predicted that this would ha this would occur, this condensation. But then he just completely overlooked that it would have these really interesting properties. And so, uh, you know, and I like that as an example of just showing smart people don't notice everything. <laughs> and so these interesting properties are, like I say, that the, the condensate is this sort of giant quantum wave function where giant is still pretty small, but it's, you know, getting up to the size of a hair. And so very easily seen with a microscope, whereas most wave functions are, are millions of times smaller than that, where you can never observe them directly. And so in the BC, you can kind of observe and manipulate the quantum states in a very direct way. And that's, and play games with it. And that's really what makes it interesting. Hello, this is Robinson Earhart here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast, number 144. And this episode is with Carl Wyman, who is Sheraton family professor, professor of physics, and professor of education emeritus at Stanford University. And Carl is also quite notably the winner of the 2001 Nobel Prize in Physics for the production and observation of the first Bose-Einstein condensate. And though, as you might imagine, we get into depth in this, a Bose-Einstein condensate, or BEC for short, is a state of matter distinct from the four states of matter we're most familiar with. So gas, solid, liquid plasma that was hypothesized by Einstein and Bose for whom Paul Dirac named bosons a hundred years ago. And it involves a supercooled configuration of bosons that has very peculiar properties. And that was not made until through the cutting edge use of laser and magnetic cooling and trapping technology Carl and his lab achieved it. So in addition to his extensive work in atomic and optimal, <laughs> optical physics, Carl has, and optimal physics, yes, but Carl has done a tremendous amount of work in the education field, which is how he has spent most of his academic efforts over the past two decades, where he has researched not only how best to teach science and structure science curricula, but also how best to actually implement these findings in practice. So this episode constitutes two dives. First, we start with Carl's career as a physicist and the research that led him to the groundbreaking work on BECs. And then we discuss his findings from much of the last 20 years that I just mentioned on the education side of things. Also, I have to mention, as always, that likes, comments, reviews, subscribes, they're always extraordinarily helpful for the show. And now, without any further ado, I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Carl. I was reading your Nobel Prize biography and... I saw that you were, one, you were raised in rural Oregon. Your father was a Sawyer. You went to a small three-room school that had, I'll add the caveat, just been converted from a one-room school. And that education in the lumber industry in the area, it wasn't really a big priority. So how was it then, uh, roughly, that you became so attracted to physics and then so advanced eventually to the point that you reached the the pinnacle of of research and discovery well you know the the people in the area of education didn't uh, wasn't considered so important but to my parents it was and they actually had curious backgrounds where they had were pretty well educated and then moved to rural Oregon as kind of escaping the society they came from, but they still put a pretty big emphasis on education. So really, I have to credit them mostly for that. But also, when I was in middle school, they moved 
to Corvallis, Oregon, specifically so that I and my siblings could go to a better school. Corvallis is a university town, so it has pretty good schools there. And that's really where I, you know, develop more of my interest in science. Mm. And then you ended up at MIT, and that's where the training really kicked in, I suppose. And the rest is, is well-documented history. <laughs> Yeah, at MIT, I mean, I I didn't actually do very well in courses, particularly at the be beginning, uh, but I got involved in research and got very involved in research and so spent my college career doing as little coursework as possible and as, spending as much time in the lab as possible. And I always figure that gave me a much better education than most students get. Yeah. Well, that was something that really stuck out of me at the bio of stuck out to me from the biography was that <laughs> you avoided taking classes as much as possible. And this might foreshadow some of what we get into later on regarding your current research on education. But why at the time was someone who is so interested in learning and creating knowledge intent on not taking classes? What was it about the classes at MIT that led you to perform poorly when clearly you're very capable and then to just not like them? Well, I mean, even though I didn't kind of appreciate the reasons until later on when I got into education research, I never really felt I was getting very much out of listening to lectures that, uh, you know, it, there wasn't much sinking in. But more than that, it seemed like in courses that what you were really doing mostly was trying to learn how to produce what the instructor wanted to see and, you know, on homework and on te test questions and so on. You know, that was what the goal was, is producing something the instructor was looking for. Whereas in the lab, you were really figuring out how nature worked and mm. and trying to understand nature, not how to score well on a test. And so I think that was kind of really the the fundamental difference is it just seemed like the the learning that one was I was getting in the laboratory was so much more kind of meaningful and authentic than what was what was happening in classes. Hmm. Well, I don't know if this resonates with you, but I'm also somebody who's very interested in learning. That's why I'm doing this at a, one reason, and I'm quite motivated to learn. But when I'm in, I also don't get much out of classes. So it's kind of funny that I'm going to be a professor. But for me, the the reason is that I just can't pay attention when I'm not playing an active role in whatever I'm doing. So I look around at other people who are able to like watch and listen to a professor lecture, but I can't, I just can't do that. I, I just get bored. I, I immediately start daydreaming, no matter how hard I try. But, you know, getting ahead of myself into the education research, in fact, that's much more the norm than the exception uh, that that nobody is really paying that much attention in, in lecture classes and and that they're not learning very much as a result. Okay, okay. Well, that's... Good to know, because it often feels like I'm the, I'm the only person in the room who's not like actively listening and taking notes. But OK, we'll leave the the education for a little later. But for now, many of the episodes that I've done on physics thus far, and I've done a bunch, have had a very broad focus on, say, like the interpretations of quantum mechanics, for instance, something that's a pretty broad topic. But I see this conversation as a really uh, 
great opportunity to get quite narrow, though, and trace one particular development in understanding an experiment. And here I, I, I naturally have in mind the Bose-Einstein condensates that you and Eric Cornell produced. But before we get into that, I wanted to ask a bit about your work that led up to it involving parity violation. And quite basically, what is parity violation in physics? And maybe I should add the caveat here that our listeners, I think, are in general very smart, and very curious, but the majority are not trained physicists, if that colors how you'll respond. Right. And p- parity is, it's a rather esoteric concept, but it's the idea that the laws of physics or most of the laws of physics look identical if you look at the behavior in a mirror. So if you do a mirror reversal of of the of what's happening, you it looks just the same. Okay. And so almost all the the behavior we see in, in fundamental physics look that have that characteristic. But it turns out there's some very exotic processes involving the weak interactions that some time ago, people discovered, gee, unlike all the electromagnetic interactions and nuclear interactions that we see that sort of determine the world around us, these weak interactions violate parity in that you do do a mere reversal of the experiment, you get a different result. And so this, this happened, though, late fifties, I guess, that they discovered this idea, but our, my work involved, uh, testing the ideas about unifying fundamental forces in physics. And so there's the so-called development of the standard model of, of physics, which was a big accomplishment in the sixties and seventies, uh, where they realized that these two different forces that people thought were quite separate and distinct, the weak force involving neutrinos and so on, and then the electromagnetic force involving charged particles like electrons and protons. People have been thinking these were just two separate things. And then the standard model came along, Weinberg, Salam, and Glashow. They got a Nobel Prize for showing how these are actually different manifestations of the same underlying so-called electroweak force. And so in our, so people were trying to test this at giant accelerator experiments at high energies and so on. And my experiment was testing that theory in a completely different way on a tabletop experiment by looking in atoms and seeing if there was a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of parity violation in the way atoms worked in the show and sort of showing this electroweak parity violating force was actually showing up in atoms. And it it's a ridiculously tiny effect, but we did lots of fancy, complicated experiments with lasers to be able to get sensitive enough to actually see it and measure that yes it was there and and it the, the predictions of the standard model work here there and so it was a good uh, just another good test of that fundamental theory mm. just to expand a bit on this notion of parity and parity violation i came across as i was reading about this a very nice example of making this macroscopic to perhaps better appeal to our listeners intuitions and you can tell me if i if i have it right but we can imagine a a a typical clock we can also imagine the mirror image of this clock that is constructed uh exactly the opposite of our clock and instead of the hands running clockwise if it is if it is constructed the exact same way, but opposite, the hands should run counterclockwise. But what we would observe in a in the case of parity violation is even though it's constructed the same exact way, the hands go clockwise on our 
uh, macroscopic reverse clock. And obviously things it's, it's not, this wouldn't happen because it's macroscopic, but it gets the intuition across that something very unexpected is happening based on the physical makeup and everything we think we know about physics. Yeah. And so that's a reasonable analogy, except that's a really extreme example. And that, and to be more corresponding to the physics, it would be that the clock runs just a slightly different rate. It, it, you know, when the new clock that you build, it actually goes the other direction, but it doesn't move at quite the same speed as it did in the first direction would be sort of more. Right. I, I think that having it run, uh, having it still run clockwise just makes more salient the, the idea. Just, of yeah, I'm just saying it's just a little more extreme than what we ever <laughs> yeah. get around to seeing in physics. And I mean, I, another, another analogy to use is just to, to think that and this is actually a correct description, which is that in the atom, in the electrons have a tiny screw sense to them. So they're like a right-handed screw. And so, you know, a, a, a screw looks, you do a mere reflection of it. It's different. It's right-handed to left-handed. And so that's sort of the distinction we see there. Hmm. Well, your team at the time, I think this was, if I have my internal timeline uh, correct, this is when you were in Boulder. Uh, your team made the best measurement at the time of parity violation in cesium, which is what you were working with. But what's what's interesting here for the purposes of the Bose-Einstein condensates, which at this point I'll refer to as BECs, is your work on laser trapping and cooling. So. Can you explain just how a laser can, one, uh, be used to trap atomic particles and two, I mean, how it can cool them? Because we're familiar with laser pointers or lasers that read CDs, or maybe we were 20 years ago, but not lasers doing this sort of thing. Right. So, so atoms will scatter laser light if you have that at exactly the right color. So each atom has kind of its favorite color. And if the light is exactly that color, then the atom gets excited and then re-emits the light. And that's why we see things at different colors. That's, that's what they're doing. And so, uh, and so that light actually has, they, we talk about it as coming in little tiny chunks called photons, and each of those chunks carries a little kick with it. And so if I shine laser light on an atom and the light is bouncing off the atom, it's giving it little tiny pushes each time it has one of these photons bounce off it. So we think of it as very much like shooting ping pong balls at a bowling ball and you know because a compared to it an atom isn't very big com heavy compared to us but compared to a photon it is big and heavy and so it gets just a tiny little push each time one of these particles of light bounces off it and so so if you think about okay you've got a bowling ball sitting there and you shine you hit it with a bunch of ping pong balls. One ping pong ball doesn't move it very much, but if you've got a whole lot and laser light allows us to get a whole lot of these photons, millions of hundreds of millions per second, there's a whole bunch of little pushes. And so that that's the basic force that we use to push the atom around with light. And then, and then you have to get a lot trickier because you have to, there's a process called the Doppler shift. And so it means that if the light is just exactly, exactly the right color, then it will tend to have those photons bounce off it more if it's moving towards the light beam than if it moves away from the light beam. And so that means that the light beam, no matter the atoms, no matter what direction they're moving, if you're sending light in from all different direct directions, no matter what direction they move, the light beam that's sort of 
hitting them in the face, the direction they're moving is the one that they feel the most force from. And so that results in them kind of slowing down because they're always having photons opposing their motion. And that slowing down, atoms, if they're slow, that means they're cold because temperature is really just the speed at which atoms are moving. And so that's the basic process by which you, you shine light on atoms to slow them down. And then there's some other tricks with magnetic fields and so on that you make them want to stay in one place and that's the atom trapping. Okay, great. And then this work, as I, I understood it, I think it was, you, you had multiple iterations of this work on parity violation and it is what led toward the work on BECs. And how did this work on cesium naturally lead in that direction? One of more powerful and efficient laser technology, and then by extension in the direction of the BECs, even though we'll, we'll hold off on what those are for a few minutes. Yeah. So, I mean, I always look at the parity violation experiment that compared to BEC, parity violation was really hard. And so we spent gosh, I don't know, almost 15 years or so on different versions of the experiment, just getting it better and better. But in that process, we had to do a lot of development of laser technology to actually do the kind of experiments we wanted to for probing the atoms well enough. And so the laser cooling and trapping work came out of that just as a, as a looking around for, okay, we put all this work into developing this laser technology for this parity experiment. Is there something easy and fun we could do with that technology? And so at that time, other people were already using laser light to cool and trap atoms, but our, our lasers that we had developed were vastly cheaper, a hundred times cheaper. They were the kind that you got in compact disc players. And so we just started out as kind of, I could say, just for fun and to show off that you could do this same kind of laser cooling with these much, much cheaper, uh, you know, lasers and apparatus. And so it, it actually, you know, like I say, it was, I look at it, it's just fun, but it was, it was really more than that because it really opened the field, the, of laser trapping and cooling up to a vastly greater number of people. Cause before you needed, you needed sort of a quarter of a million dollars in lasers. And this was 40 years ago. And that was a lot of money. And before you could even get started in it. And we started then showed no for a few hundred, you could start doing that. And so that just meant a lot more people could start working in the field and do more experiments. And, you know, people don't really think about important lay physics contributions as finding a way to do things cheaper. But in fact, it, in this case, it really was, I think, an important contribution to the really advancing the whole field. Mm -hmm. I think what you're touching on there is also one of the major reasons that physics is so well funded though maybe it's not funded well enough but because of these technological advances that physics departments produce that can then be appropriated by industry but i would not at all have expected the parity violation experiments to be so much more difficult than the becs and i'm getting myself getting ahead of myself here uh but because Bose and Einstein predicted the condensates in 1924 to 25. And it was, of course, a topic of major interest well before the time you were working on it. So I just would have assumed that it was very different, difficult because people had already reached dead ends and nobody knew how to produce one. Uh, you know, it wasn't easy, but in fact, we came in with a different, just a completely different approach. This. I see. Uh, I mean, we, people were trying to produce it by using sort of traditional, you know, to, to get a hit, explain BEC, you need to get atoms really, really cold. And it's this, if you get them cold enough, they turn into this new state of matter. That was what Einstein predicted. Mm -hmm. And so people have been trying for many years 
to get them cold enough by using traditional refrigeration. And we came in with saying, no, let's try this completely new technology of laser cooling and trapping as a, as a route to getting the conditions you need. And that's, so, you know, it was just, a, I mean, it maybe wasn't easy to realize that was a better way to go, but once you realized it, it, it was, it wasn't easy, but it wasn't that hard to actually figure then out how to, how to achieve. Hmm. Well, turning to, BECs now. I mean, everybody knows who Einstein is. I don't think everybody knows who Bose is, but Bose was also an important quantum physicist. He and Einstein developed Bose-Einstein statistics. And I think Paul Dirac, you can correct me if I'm wrong, he he named bosons after Bose. Uh, we'll get to bosons in a second. But f for now, I think the the first crucial concept that we need to introduced prior to discussing the BECs is that of spin. And what intuitively is the spin of an elementary particle? And then if you care to add uh, some ways maybe in which a particle's spin affect its behavior um, and other capacities. So that's actually a very difficult subject, really. I mean, it's... It, it's one of the more complicated concepts in physics, I find, of the fact that particles have this kind of basic quantity we call spin, and it's you can think of it as sort of the tiny quantum mechanical analog of angular momentum of how they're rotating around. But it's not really that, because it's more just a fundamental property that a particle has. And it turns out that they, the way they behave at a very basic level is determined by their spin. And so ones that are half integer spin, we call fermions, and one that are integer spins, integer, uh, a tiny constant called planktons, and integer spins we call bosons. And they behave in completely different ways. Uh, but... You know, I, it's always struggle to kind of find some kind of reasonable yeah, right. analogy for spin. And it's really, you just really can't do it because it's just this, this tiny microscopic quantum mechanical property that particles have. Uh, sure. Yeah. I, I hesitate to speculate about what most people do or don't know about quantum mechanics, but I, I think, and I'll put scare quotes around that, that when most people hear the word boson, they think on the one hand, as you mentioned, subatomic particle of integer spin. Maybe they don't. Maybe they don't think that at all. And then on the other, that they think of the Higgs boson, just because that's been in the the press, which gives particles mass. And then maybe the the force carriers uh, like photons, gluons, and so on. But these are not the elementary. These are elementary bosons. They're not the sorts of bosons that were the subject of your Nobel work with the, the BECs. So can you explain the connection between these elementary bosons and then composite bosons? Uh, well, it's, it, you know, it's just anything with an integer spin as a boson. So you can have a, a fundamental particle that's a single, single entity. And if it's got an integer spin, it's still a boson, but then you can have, a cesium atom, which is what we work with, which has a whole bunch of electrons and protons in it. But all of those, and each of those actually have spins. And if they just add up to be integer, then it, then the composite is a, is a boson. Now it's a little more subtle than that because if you want to treat it as a boson, you have to kind of stay far enough away from it so that it looks like just this single composite entity. If you get too close to it, then you start seeing it as made up of a bunch of separate, inter, you know, different both electrons and protons that are actually fermions. Right. And so that's one of the tricks in the work we do is you, 
we cool these atoms down, way down, but we have to do it in such a way that we keep them far apart compared to the size of the atom itself. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves to the experimental design, but I, I know that you use cesium for the parity violation experiments, at least some iterations of them, but I thought that you used uh, an element, I think number 37, called rubidium for the the experiments on BECs, which was also, of course, a boson. But did you use both of them? or No, when I, it, it's kind of a funny story there, actually, which is that we started out with you working with cesium because that was the lasers we were working with sort of happened to work pretty well at that for that particular atom, its favorite color. And then then as we moved into Bose-Einstein condensation, one of the problems was that, you know, I, I said that we opened up this field to lots of people because you could get cheaper lasers to do it. Well, because of that, lots of people were buying the lasers that you needed. And so we had trouble Blind actually demand. getting the getting the lasers that would work for cesium uh, just because the market. <laughs> and so, and so we looked around and from our basic physics point of view, we thought that rubidium could work as well as cesium. There was no real different reason to think they were different. And, but there were a couple of virtues to rubidium. First, it has two different isotopes, so different number of protons in that in the nucleus. And that was important because one of the things we realized is that when you make a and you make these heavy atoms like these are into a Bose Einstein condensate, you can either have them effectively repelling each other so that they'll stay there and be happy or you could have them attracted to each other, which would make the condensate just collapse in on itself very immediately. And you would be boring and you couldn't really do anything with it. And when we kind of looked at what people could predict would be happening, the, the theoretical physicists just couldn't predict which any given atom would be. And so rubidium meant that we had two choices basically <laughs> to find you know if you if one of them had this so-called attractive interaction then that maybe the other one wouldn't have so it gave us two throws of the dice that way but also probably more importantly it's the resonant light color for rubidium was very close to what they use in the compact disc players. <laughs> and so uh, in in the lasers they made for that. And so that just meant that it was a lot easier to buy lasers that worked for rubidium. So it, it was just kind of a funny accident. And it turns out that, in fact, cesium doesn't work. Uh, it You kind of lose the, on the throw of the dice with cesium. And so we were just lucky in the way in the transition. Mm. Well, we'll get right back to the Bose, the BECs. But while we're talking about rubidium, this isn't this isn't relevant to the experiment. But I think it's just interesting. We don't ever encounter rubidium in daily life, but it's an interesting substance, uh, at least uh, visually. Some of its behavior. What, could you say maybe a bit about what it was like and what working with it is like? Or maybe you maybe you had it in such small quantities you weren't observing these interesting macroscopic properties that it has. Well, we didn't do too much. I mean, we do work with it just very small quantities and what happens and mostly when it's just in a vapor, not in a solid. But, you know, it's a it's one of the so-called alkali atoms. And so it's it's that means it's got an extra electron so it's very reactive so you have to avoid exposing it to air especially exposing it to water and work with it carefully and it's kind of a shiny gold color when it's <laughs> sitting there in a vacuum and it's a and it melts at 
almost room temperature. Uh, so when you're working with it, you you can actually melt it very easily and move it around. In our experiments, mostly we would just so work with very dilute vapors of it, uh, you know, in a, in a very weak gas and the color of laser light to excite it is very deep red. So just at the edge of where your eye can actually observe it. Hmm. Yeah. When I was looking at rubidium, it very much reminded me of mercury in that it's this, well, it's like you said, it's very reactive. It starts, it could start fires if it become comes in contact with water. So it is stored at least for photographic purposes in glass vials. And it just, it's like this, glittering glistening uh liquid at slightly above room temperature metal very pretty but i i also saw that they've injected it into rat i mean we all have like less than a gram of it in our body uh but if you inject it into rats if like 50 percent of the their potassium so it behaves like potassium in the blood in the cells and if more than 50 percent of your potassium is replaced rats is replaced by rubidium the rats die so that was inter- inter- interesting factoid about rubidium but getting back to the becs so what are some of its properties i mean beyond the fact that there are there are four regularly observable states of matter uh, i just did an episode with a plasma physicist in hutchinson's of mit so we've talked all about plasma but there's plasma gas solid liquid that's what we typically observe in day-to-day life and this is not one of them since becs don't live at room temperature yeah i mean so We call it a macroscopic quantum state. And what we mean by that is that when you get these atoms and you get them cold enough, they they condense, they fuse together into a so-called BEC. But that's really a giant quantum wave function is the is the configuration they take. And so, you know, no then that's really what's interesting about BEC is, you know, it's kind of curious that it forms, but what's really interesting is just the behaviors of its properties. And it's sort of worth noting that uh, Einstein was just working with the equations and he predicted that this would ha- this would occur, this condensation, but then he just completely overlooked that it would have these really interesting properties. And so, uh, you know, and I like that as an example of just showing smart people don't notice everything. <laughs> and so these interesting properties are, like I say, that the, the concept is this sort of giant quantum wave function where giant is still pretty small, but it's, you know, getting up to the size of a hair. And so very easily seen with a microscope, whereas most wave functions are are millions of times smaller than that, where you could never observe them directly. And so in the BC, you can kind of observe and manipulate the quantum states in a very direct way. And that's, and play games with it. And that's really what makes it interesting. Mm -hmm. So how cold are we talking one? Uh, so the, 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 to form it originally, it gets down to about a tenth of a micro kelvin. So that's a that's a tenth of a millionth of a degree above absolute zero, which is so as cold as it gets. Zeros. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we actually in later experiments got down to about one nano kelvin, which is. Uh, a billion, you know, one billionth of a degree of above absolute zero. And yeah, that's as cold as it gets. And in fact, nothing really interesting happens once you get colder because it just, as you get colder, it just means that a, a bigger fraction of your sample is in the Bose condensate. And you're already, once you've got most everything in the condensate, that's the only, nothing interesting ap- after that happens. Mm. This is, speculative not physically interesting but as i was reflecting on the becs 
my understanding is this is so cold that this temperature is like never reached in nature. So Bose Einstein content that don't occur naturally. And it's, it's fascinating to think that over the entire lifetime of the universe and the future, physics predicts things that can happen, entire states of matter that would just never occur if it weren't for humans or uh, other in, intelligent life around Alpha Centauri uh, <laughs> making bees. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I agree because we know the coldest place in nature is sort of you know, interstellar space, and that's three degrees above absolute zero from the radiation left over from the Big Bang at the formation of the universe. And that's millions of times too hot. And so, yeah, I that is sort of a cute thing about PEC is it can only exist because of human ingenuity. Mm -hmm. And then, let's see. What is if it's if it's possible to describe like what it is like visually to inspect this macroscopic or borderline macroscopic with a microscope wave function? What are the sorts of behaviors that you're witnessing that outside of a BEC are just not possibly perceptible? Well, I mean, what we look at is actually not that exciting. Uh, I mean, we just look at shadows. And so you you shine light on the thing and you take it and it absorbs that light and and makes a shadow. And we and so we image the the light beam that's going by and and see a shadow that gives you the shape of the BEC. And so uh you know, it's just a little dark region in a in a beam of light. So, you know, that's not really that exciting. But then the the shape of that shadow and how it changes under different conditions and and how it uh, interacts with other things, that's really the things we're looking at. And, I see. I saw that there are like vortices of a sort. I saw that the other uh the other experiment experimenter i think his name was wolfgang ketterle uh, at mit who produced a bec a few months after you he also uh, you know this but our listeners don't that he he received a third of the nobel prize share your collaborator eric cornell got the other third and he observed in his sample uh, and I think he still works on them very much so. Uh, wave interference patterns, like, I mean, of the sort that are very well known, even in the zeitgeist with like the twin slit experiment, that sort of thing. That's right. Yeah, you can take condensate and put it back together in two pe you know, pieces and, and it forms an interference pattern, which is, you know, some kind of rather striking when you think about it, sort of making atoms go away or, or canceling out their existence. And that's, that starts to seem pretty strange. Right. Where they behave like a wave when you expect them to behave like particles. And it really, I mean, that's what the philosophers of physics are, are still wrapping their minds around many a hundred years later. But now beyond the bare feet of experimentally confirming a, a 75 year old theoretical prediction made by Einstein of all people. And I suppose we also have to throw in the sheer interest for a physicist of this macroscopic wave function. What was it about this problem in particular that made it so interesting to you as a physicist that you were really intent on producing the BECs or maybe that those two things encapsulated it? Yeah, they pretty much encapsulate it. You know, it, it it was it was labeled as the holy grail of atomic physics because uh, people have been trying to get it for so long. So, you know, just being able to to make it was it was nice. But then, then we could we could study its properties and how it behaved under different conditions, and it and then it it allows you in particular to since it is sort of this giant quantum mechanical system, it allows you to explore the 
transition between what we talk about as kind of the the microscopic quantum mechanical world and the macroscopic classical world we live in now and you know people people kind of knew what happens at each extreme but not nearly so well what happens in that intermediate region and so a lot of the experiments with BEC were sort of probing that region then and sort of with kind of essentially big quantum mechanics and, and what happens in that intermediate area. I'd like to talk a, a little bit more about the experiment before we move on. And we've already talked about the fascinating subject, rubidium, but I'm particularly curious about the two key techniques that were used to lower its temperature. So we already talked about the laser cooling and I'm wondering if there were any dimensions novel to this particular experiment in the laser cooling that enabled you to get the rubidium to these extremely low temperatures, or if they were just incremental development on the technology that we've already described. And then we didn't discuss the magnetic evaporative cooling. And I'd, li I'd like to hear a little bit about how that works. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, the, you know, this involved, uh, was a little bit different than what other people have been doing with laser cooling and trapping and that we just would start out with a very dilute gas by most people's standards, a good vacuum of rubidium and shine our lasers in and collect atoms into our trap. And so to gather up the bunch of laser cooled and trapped atoms that way as a starting point. But then one of the things that, that we we had done is in our earlier experiments, we understood and, and in a way other people hadn't before kind of how atoms were behaving in that laser trap and what limited their density and temperature. And that was kind of the edge we had in, in that previous kind of basic atomic physics of of recognizing then what we need to do differently to get to Bose-Einstein condensation. So, and it, it, what that work showed us was that the, the density and temperature of these atoms in the laser trap were limited by the, these photons bouncing back and forth between the different trapped atoms and giving them kicks back and forth. And so we realized to get them colder, we had to get rid of the, the light. And so we would start out with that sample, getting it as cold as we could and as dense as we could with the lasers. And then we'd turn off the lasers and then hold it in a magnetic trap. And that was just a set of magnetic fields of the right shape, which because rubidium atoms have little magnets attached to them, you can use the magnetic force to just hold them there so they're sitting in a vacuum, not touching anything and staying nice and cold. And that was kind of the starting point when we realized, yeah, we could easily trap them and keep them cold. And so then we could think about, okay, taking the next stage of getting them further cooled. And so that was this evaporative cooling out of the magnetic trap. And so, the way evaporative cooling works is exact is actually the same physics that cools your cup of coffee uh, when you you know when you see the steam coming off your coffee that's actually the most energetic coffee molecules leaping out of the cup and they're as they do that they take away more than their share of the energy and so what's left behind is colder and so we use the same basic principle with we've got these, this very cold, this sample sitting in our magnetic trap and we let the most energetic atoms get out the top of that trap. And we have to actually lower the sides of the trap as it gets colder and colder to keep, to keep letting the most energetic ones come out, even though the sample is colder mm. and until it gets cold enough to, go into a Bose condensate. Hmm. Well, that's funny. This is where I reveal what a rube I really am because I I would have thought of the 
I, I don't I don't think I'd ever actually thought about this before, but I would have thought about the steam, those molecules coming out of the coffee cup as the laziest molecules that like couldn't couldn't stick it out in the heat. So they're just leaving because the the coffee cup remains hot. But that makes sense. And, and you know, if you it, it's why if you put a lid on your coffee cup, it stays warmer a long time, a lot longer because it turns off the evaporative cooling. And this is a question that you've uh, probably gotten a lot, but I, I'm I'm quite curious. You see the eureka moment in movies all the time. I wonder how you felt the the. I mean, because especially because you described it as the holy grail of atomic physics. How did you feel the moment you knew your experiment had been successful? You'd produced the condensate, and you had the this intangible. I mean, you don't want to touch. Uh, you don't want to touch the the condensate, but you had the holy grail in a sense. I mean, th this was actually an unusual experiment, in that most experiments you do, you spend a few years building them, and then you turn them on, and they don't work, and then you spend a, another year finding the ways they don't work and fixing them, and then you start to see some tiny little signal and then you figure out how to turn knobs to make it bigger and bigger and eventually you've got some reasonable signal that you know you is credible you can show to other people uh in this case it was quite different because we we built a new apparatus that we thought would give us we this was kind of our third iteration of, of figuring out what what we needed to do better and building and you know the, the new apparatus and we turned it on and it just came out incredibly dramatically the the Bose condensate formed and like I say it was this dark little shadow but it it was you know this very dark shadow just the shape and temperature where we expected to see it so it was very very clear it made for great pictures to get on the cover of science magazine and so on uh, so it was really unusual compared to most any other experiment I've done. Uh, and so, you know, that was very exciting. The, the immediate reaction was that it was too good to be true because usually in experiments, if they were better than you even hoped for, they never turned out to be right. <laughs> and so, you know, so then there was a period of a couple of days of, just trying to think of turning all the knobs you could to, to test it in different ways to make sure that we weren't just fooling ourselves into thinking we were seeing something that wasn't really happening. So, Do you remember which restaurant you went to that night to celebrate in Palo Alto? Because I'm always, well, this was, this was some time ago. Maybe it's not around anymore, but I'm always looking for good food in the area. <laughs> well, this was in Boulder, remember? Oh, but, right. uh, Darn. But, but no, we didn't go to anything to celebrate it. We were too busy thinking of checks to do on the experiment got for it. a while. Got it. Got it. Okay. Well, talking about the well, okay. Earlier, we were we were talking about the laser cooling, and I just made the aside comment. This is one reason that physics departments are so well funded is that a lot of the discoveries even if they're just advancements in the experimental apparatus used and, and not necessarily the findings they make their way to industry and that's that's important for business and talking about the magnetic trap made me make this connection to spin but we were talking about spin earlier and how it's this sort of difficult quantum property of particles to wrap one's head around. But one application that we're all familiar with is MRIs, magnetic resonance imaging, in, in which I mean, there's a whole suite of different techniques used, but just basically a magnetic field targets certain particles and gets them all to have the same or a certain spin. And then a detector is it, and this is how metal, a detector detects this and is able to generate an image based on it. And metal detectors have a, a sort of similar way of working. But what I'm leading toward is, are there any particular neat or industrially important applications of BECs? So did your work 
spawn anything uh, that has become a money maker for people or a potential money maker? Uh, no, they, the answer to that is it, it hasn't. Uh, and the only, there are some things where people are looking at using it for new ultra sensitive detectors that you might use for magnetic fields or gravity that, you know, could, could have some applications for looking for a white hole or something. But as far as I know, there no, none actually exist yet. And, you know, I have to say, this has surprised me a little bit because I, and, it, and it's because of the comparison with the laser, because people invent the laser and after, you know, it took a few years, several years, but then they have all kinds of applications for laser light now, you know, use it for surgery and cutting and all our communications are sent over using laser light and check out stands, <laughs> you know, and the, the BEC, it's really the exact atom analog in that laser light, what makes it unique and special is all the light, all the photons of light are behaving in exactly the same way. And so you can control them and in a much better way than you can normal light. And that's really what makes the laser useful. And so BEC is the same way with all the atoms doing the same thing. And so in principle, you can control them better than you can with any other atom sample. But so, you know, when I, we first made this, I thought, well, and you know, it'll take a, several years, but people will start to find ways to apply this. And they, they really haven't. Uh, and I, and I think that's because with lasers, the first lasers were really complicated and clunky, but people figured out how to make much cheaper and simpler lasers. And nobody's figured out a cheaper, better, simpler way to make the EC. And that's, you know, in a way, that's maybe a statement of why, because it's so hard, maybe we were just super clever or people haven't been smart enough but uh yeah so the the process just remains so so complicated and so power consuming that people can't make BECs very well and so i think they just can't use them very well much yet mm. well carl this has been exactly the the deep dive into the Nobel work and the BECs that I'd been hoping for. So I know it's been a while since the experiment and the work, but I'm very thankful that you were willing to rehash and explain it as extraordinarily well as you did. But now I'd like to turn to the work that you've been doing for the most part since then. And really, I, so you had, re you had reached the pinnacle. You had the Holy Grail. I'm sure there were plenty of other experiments you could have been working on other perhaps uh nobel worthy lines of research so what motivated the shift in your attention from doing research in physics to research in education especially when as we already discussed you did not like taking classes at mit so you know the, the reality was that i was interested in education research way before I won the Nobel Prize. And so for for some serious number of years before the the BEC, I actually had two parallel research groups, one working on the BEC work and one on the one in science education work. And and I continued that for a number of years after the the Nobel Prize. But then then I, I reached the point where, you know, it was just clear to me that I wasn't going to do anything in physics nearly as important as <laughs> as I had. I mean, you know, I could do more experience, we were doing more experiments with BEC, but it, at some level, it, you know, it was just a reality. There were so many other people working in it that anything I did was not going to be that special or unique anymore. And but I did feel that there were things that I could contribute 
fairly uniquely to education and improving it. And it, you know, it was, it was in part because I had a Nobel prize. And so I, I could talk about, I could go and talk to physics professors about teaching and I, you know, for better or worse, I had credibility that other people didn't have who were working in education. And so people could listen to me and I could, I set up a big institute for changing education this way where, you know, like I say, I don't think anybody else would have been able to make that happen just because they didn't have the, the reputation I did. And, you know, and I, I just thought that was more important really at that point. Well, I mean, beyond the Nobel prize though, you, I, maybe this wasn't, a talent you were born with and you developed it. But I was not blowing smoke when I said that you explained that. I mean, what we've been talking about for the past hour extraordinarily well for not people who are not trained physicists. And it people listening, it might sound like it was very easy for you to do it. And maybe it was easy for you to do it, but I've, I've, uh, done 160 plus interviews now at this point with people like you who are among the most accomplished in the world or in their fields. And you probably wouldn't be, you won't be surprised at all to hear this, but they could be extraordinarily brilliant, but I struggle to get people to make things accessible. I know that they can, they can talk, they could read a research paper, but it's a different skill being able to communicate the work to people who aren't already familiar with it. So you have that skill going for you too, beyond the. Well, but you know, that's, that's an acquired skill that comes from, I spent a lot of time working with students trying to see what, they can understand what confuses them, what language, you know, is, is accessible or not accessible. And that, so it's, it's something that I'd say is definitely acquired through practice mm -hmm. and some of my research really at looking, helping people learn. Well, I'd like to hold off on the actual research for a few more minutes because you wrote in the again, the, the Nobel biography that you've had a very successful career as a physicist, to put it lightly, despite not having taken and consequently to at least the point that you wrote this biography mastered much of the undergraduate physics material, which is extraordinarily surprising. But given the career that you've had, how does this inform how you think about what it means to have a good education in physics. If you can have, you can be the sort of physicist that you've been without having what is considered, you haven't mastered all of the, the undergraduate material. Well, so first I should say that I, I try to be very careful not to use my, you know, when I talk about my education and ed education research, not to use myself as kind of, data in this because I think far too many people kind of think about education just in terms of their own personal experience when I so I like to make sure I ground it in real data from other people right. but I and that's very but I very will different. say that and you know that at least what it convinces you know my own experience is kind of an existence proof that you don't need to cover all these different topics you need to learn to think about the physics as a fundamental in a fundamental useful way and you need to learn how to learn and that you know i think that does generally apply to to all students and so when people are trying to tell me oh no we have to cover all this different material or they won't you know it can't be physicists and you know that like i say it's just kind of i have the existence proof that i know it's not true that they're never we're never going to teach them all they need to learn and they're you know and they're never going to learn much of what or use much of what we do teach them and so uh whether you're looking at me or anybody you've wanted 
what's really important is that they they know how to think and they know how to learn and that is just going to lots of lectures on lots of subjects don't doesn't accomplish that yeah i i couldn't agree with that more and before we get into some of the findings i mean just as we did with the becs i think the 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 lead up was very nice let's talk about one of the major projects that you've spearheaded and so what was the science education initiative the sei uh, just as we did with the bose einstein condensates reducing them to BECs at the the University of Colorado and then I think it was the University of British Columbia. Yeah, that's right. And so what that was was it and that's really it was to start that that I gave up working in atomic physics because I I it was really an an effort to see what was possible in terms of large scale change in teaching because there the kind of research that I was doing and many other people have been doing had shown that there were just much more effective ways to teach than what was being done in all these lecture classrooms in science and so but nobody was really looking at how you get those into practice you know they they were always just uh, these odd experiments by some individual committed faculty members and so so i really these the science education initiative was really a very explicit you know carefully thought out approach of how to bring this form of teach this better forms of teaching to many different faculty to change how entire departments taught and so and so it was a an effort to do that at, and like i say it was the 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 biggest part of it was at UBC where we got the biggest results but then i had we had sort of a satellite program also at colorado to to try and do much the same thing the basic goal was the basic goal was to just try and change how science was being taught to to be used more effective teaching methods. Okay, so then just to clarify for me or just to recapitulate, there was already at this point a, a broad body of knowledge about small scale interventions and what could be done to teach better. This was really about in the real world, can we implement this at a university and make a large scale change? Yeah. Okay, so this was yeah, about implementation. Was, it, it's, it was yeah, and about institute really institutional change as opposed to kind of individual change. Hmm. Well, just as just as you said a few minutes ago, we don't want to take an N of one, or in our case, an N of two, because both of us have had less than satisfactory experiences or outcomes from attending lectures. So, but before so in this same vein, before we launch into this, I think a prior question just has to be asked outside of our end of two. And is there a great need for teaching reform and improvement in universities? Like have, have changes in technology or student body or anything like this led to worse outcomes than there were in the past? Or is this just a general drive for improvement? How do we know that, like, that this is a worthwhile uh, project beyond the anecdotal experience of a couple of people like you and me. Yeah. Well, so first the, you know, if you look historically, the outcomes are pretty bad, uh, in that, that for, for as long as people have been looking at it, the number of students who start out majoring in science, uh, at college and, and, and actually complete that major is pretty low you lose something in the range of 50 percent of them just give up switch out flunk out drop out whatever and so you you have that as one outcome that's not very good and then the other outcome is just looking at what students capabilities are <laughs> after they're completed their education and i think for a long time lots of people will 
will say, you know, that yes, there may be some who seem to really be good, but an awful lot of other people you hear from industry all the time, how these people come out with their degrees and then they can't really perform in the, in the job setting. They're, they can't solve problems. They can't communicate well and, and so on. So I think that I think, and, and then the third aspect is that just the, I think the, the, who were, who we're educating and the, the population that we're turning out of, of scientifically qualified and literate people is, has been very limited. And so I, I would argue that really, you know, people are paying more attention to it now, but really the, the shortcomings of kind of student outcomes have been there for a, a very long time. And, you know, back with Sputnik, came around that there was a big push to try and improve science education and they tried a lot of things. I don't think they were terribly successful, but they, even back then they were recognizing the, the problems with the education system. I'd like to play devil's advocate for a moment and entertain, like, I think a very, I'm not s suggesting that this is true, but I think it's a, hypothesis that maybe should be asked well one just another sort of story my mentor sort of person he's not at stanford he's at columbia his name's haim gaifman he is uh, a very senior faculty member he's from israel and he grew he came up teaching in a very different time where they might have two or three, he's a mathematician, they might have had two or 300 people in a class. And he was trying to fail the vast majority of them. He failed a, a former prime minister of Israel, <laughs> which I just find very funny, but in like a calculus class. But their goal was to produce a few like astronomically gifted students, like maybe like pressure in a coal turns into diamond, something like that. Maybe they'd get a few good people out of it. So one, this is, this isn't the, the total dimension that I was going in, but maybe the, the difficult way or the teaching methods now, per, more people don't do well, but a few people have stellar outcomes. And maybe this isn't borne out by the evidence maybe you maybe you want to answer this before i move on to where i was really going <laughs> yeah so i mean i think that's been the case for a long time and and people are paying more attention to it now i mean it was it it used to be much more typical that 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 instructors saw that they had a responsibility to flunk some large fraction of the the students and what I th think, and we have research on this, is that this was just a fundamentally flawed belief system that you had a few talented people and your job was to sort out those people with talent. And now we know that that's just wrong, that it's much more that, that you know, a good education develops people's capabilities. And so if you have good education, you can have vastly more people and more competent people than what you had if you're just trying to to sort them into, you know, those who are you decide to have talent and those who don't. And one of the things we've learned actually from studies we've done is find out how students preparation coming into college makes a tremendous difference on what their grades are in introductory physics. And so what, what we realize is that instructors kind of have this implicit belief in talent that they want to make the course good for the most talented students. But really what all they're doing is optimizing the course for the ones who've been the most educationally privileged and that they're sorting on educational privilege, not anything to do with what a person's possible capabilities are. Mm. Well, here is where I was going when I said I wanted to play devil's advocate. And I'm, I'm having an interview in a, in a month or so with 
a very prominent intelligence researcher. But at this point, I really know nothing about the research on intelligence. But I've heard this figure thrown out that to be a successful research scientist, you need to have a minimum IQ of 130, say that just we can entertain that as a possibility. And if this is the case, and if a, a physics curriculum is meant to, tr and maybe this is an assumption that you'd want to deny, that it is meant to train future research physicists, then perhaps the people who are with an IQ in the class of less than 120, less than 125, they just aren't expected to do well in the course. And unless the distribution of students is such that the majority of people have an IQ of 130 or more, then maybe shifting the methods isn't really going to help. Yeah. So I just... I just deny your assumption that you need to have a, an IQ. I don't think that, I don't think the data supports that. The, the one, I don't know exactly for research scientists. I do know data from chess masters and they find they don't have particularly high IQs. Oh, very uh, interesting. You know, and, uh, and the, the, this, and the, I do know other work where people have looked and seen how people have particularly high IQs or particular spatial abilities and so on. And but then they they look at people who are highly successful in the discipline, and it's really that it's all about what skills you learned, uh, not what you started out with. And it, if anything, it's more the the education system as opposed to people's uh, uh, capabilities sort on these things like IQ or spatial ability rather than, and it, it's just because people aren't given the opportunities <laughs> if they don't match that model. But uh, yeah, so I just don't think that's true. Uh, there's a lot of work by a uh, cognitive psychologist who I think highly of called Anders Ericsson. And he studies what he calls deliberate practice. And he shows how people's ex level of expertise in all different athletic and intellectual fields is really determined by how much of this intense mental practice they have of certain kinds that he calls deliberate practice. And he's shown over and over again that how that things like measures of talent or IQ, they may make a difference at the very beginning stages of learning something, but very quickly as you move into any higher levels of moderate to higher levels of expertise, its outcomes are really determined by the, the education, the deliberate practice, as opposed to any measures of that people have for predicting how people are going to come. So that, that that's my, my belief. And I think it's backed by the research is that it's a real mistake to think that, that you can sort people by IQ and have that be a reasonable value of how good they can be in some activity. Well, I'm really glad that I asked you that because I think the, intuitive response is sure how intelligent somebody is going to be is going to correlate with their success. So I, I, your response is really interesting. And I, I've taken down Anders Ericsson's name. This seems like it would be a really good person, a really good conversation to have. It, you know, when you, when you dig into this, as I have, you really start getting more and more skeptical because you start looking at what IQ tests really measure and, you know, they're very limited in what they measure. They almost all can be, people can greatly improve in them with practice. And so, you know, it raises all kinds of questions about what, what an IQ measurement is and what it means. And it's, and it, the more you, the deeper you get into it, the more skeptical you get that it's going to be good at 
seeing how well somebody's going to be in something like physics. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that the probably the most interesting dimensions of this work to our listeners will probably be the the ways that teaching can or ought to change. But I'd like to talk a bit more about the SEI first because there there are still some implementation findings of broad interest. And you've done a substantial amount of work on this implementation side. So one item that stuck out to me is that the most difficult problem on the faculty end of things is the incentive system of a research university and what, well, maybe you want to elaborate that, but how does this elaborate on that? How does this relate to their teaching success, how they're, how they're compensated, promoted, this sort of thing? Yeah. I mean, you know, when I, people complain, particularly if they focus on teaching that at research universities, that everything just depends on research accomplishments and teaching never really matters. And I think that's largely true, uh, but it's driven really by the fact mostly that there's such poor measures of teaching quality that nobody really believes in them. And so, whereas we have very elaborate, detailed, and I would argue pretty accurate measurements of, of research productivity. And so they're mostly being rewarded for what you can measure well. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the reality is that I think faculty are doing just what they're getting rewarded for and what they're get really getting evaluated on. And, and so, the fact we have such poor evaluations of teaching is really the the heart of the problem. Yeah, you said faculty are doing well what they're rewarded for. And I saw I thought that this was interesting that competitive grants within or between departments, if I interpreted what I read correctly, had a the, these grants were based on teaching success had a positive impact on implementation and outcomes. And it just makes sense if faculty are doing what they are paid to do and they're paid now, or the department is paid based on teaching success and the teaching is going to be better. Whereas right now, all of the incentives are based on how many papers you publish this sort of thing. Yeah. So, you know, the, in the, the SAI, we designed it around a bunch of different important factors. We figured you needed to have support for the faculty to, to learn how to teach better, but you also had, need to have incentives to the department and to the individual faculty to want to, to do, <laughs> to teach better. And so we had this competitive grant program where departments would compete for substantial chunks of money up to a couple million dollars that they would get in order if they were committed to implementing these these ideas and that made a big difference this question of compensation and incentives though it opens up a much broader question about what the function of the university or college fundamentally is. And my understanding is that, let's say, a, a top-notch school like Williams or an Amherst, these are liberal arts colleges. They don't focus that much on research and their focus is, I mean, their, their professors do research. I mean, they're highly accomplished, but they're compensated and the incentive system is structured so that they will put more focus on teaching. And that's why a lot of students go there. Whereas a lot of faculty are interested in going to a research institution like Stanford or Harvard or MIT or something like that, because they will be compensated for research. They'll have great graduate students to do their research and they'll be able to win Nobel prizes and do things like that. So that's tr fairly true. Uh, it, I've always been struck by actually when you look at many of these 
the leading liberal arts institutions, how heavily they actually still weight research in the evaluations, uh, much more so than makes makes any sense given their and and especially when you get to the the second tier, you know, I'm I'm always astonished that they put as much weight on research as they do given their mission and their student population. So that's a problem. So I, I, I also find this interesting now that you mention it, that the liberal arts institutions do still give a lot of weight to research and or their and that's how their incentives are structured because if you apply to a job at Amherst or Williams, you better have a great research record and they're going to expect you to continue that even though their focus is presumably on the teaching. Yeah. And they're still going to look at how many papers you publish. It's going to matter a lot. Mm -hmm. so. so beyond implementation, then what does the actual research both from the domain of psychology departments and education departments suggest are the general tenets of effective teaching and how do they differ from this current sort of lecture-based model that you and I both had to, I, I still have to endure it. You, you don't. Yeah. <laughs> right. So first I'm going to correct you a little bit Please. on who's producing the research because really the most of the research um, is actually coming from what we call discipline-based education research. And that's actually faculty in science departments and to some extent engineering departments who are actually doing the, the actual education research. Uh, and and they're, they're actually probably doing the most significant uh, work in this area, not schools of education who almost always just focus on K-12 and psychology. There are some, a few people in cognitive psychology who, who look at this and I rely on their work, but, but it's more, more the, the science department research. But anyway, what it tells us is that sort of at the basic level, the people learn what their brains practice. And so you need to have the, the uh, good education has the students very actively thinking about the subject and then, and getting feedback on their thinking and to improve it. And so that means that in the class, rather than listening to lectures, the students are actually working on solving problems and and having to make problem solving decisions and, and writing those down. And the instructor is monitoring how they're doing and then regularly giving them feedback on how to improve their thinking. And almost always, uh, this is done in the context of having students work in small groups because it turns out there's a, a lot of educational benefits to the social interaction of people learn by explaining things to others and they get feedback from others. And so that's really the, the, the educational process or that really works. But it, you know, I think at the, the sort of simplest bottom line is that the, the brain learns what it practices intently with good feedback on improving it. And so you need to give the student the, educational experiences where they're doing that and they're doing it all the time as much as possible. All right. I have, I have no reason to suspect otherwise, but that coheres totally with what I, I would expect and have experienced. But so what level of improvement and in what dimensions have you seen in practice, maybe in particular experiments or courses where these changes are implemented? So maybe in the SAI, even the, the departments that successfully managed to implement the new teaching methods, what did you find? Yeah. Yeah. So for mo most of the time, we don't really have careful compare control comparisons, but we do have some some cases where we carefully controlled 
you know, got data on different ways to do things and did comparisons. And so one, one of those that we have, uh, I've seen now in multiple places where they've, they've just looked at the drop and failure rates. And that's about, that's about 30 per, after changing the teaching, that's about 30% of what it was when they were doing more traditional teaching. And then in one experiment that I was somewhat involved with that's got quite a bit of attention as we, uh, and this was done at the SEI, is that one of the introductory physics courses, the, uh, there was a, it was a great big course. And so there were two, two sections that we could have measure the student population was essentially identical. And so one of those courses was taught by the professor who had been teaching this material for a long time and had good student ratings, but used a lecture approach. And then the other was taught by somebody who was trained in my program on this research-based teaching. And so they, they agreed to cover the same material in the same amount of class time. And then they gave both classes a test on what they a surprise quiz on just covering the material that they'd uh, done and that you know I it's better to actually see the histogram of results but the the the, the results are are very dramatic it's like three three standard deviations improvement with the with the research-based class sort of everybody moving up a lot and the lecture class being very close to zero uh, in the in the learning and so that you know like i say that's a particularly clean comparison but that's the kind of thing you can get it's you touched on this subject a few minutes ago when you were talking about how the current model, at least in physics, favors students who have just had good high school educations in physics, and it's not actually indicative of, or their success is not indicative of some inherent talent or higher IQ or other aptitude, aptitude. But more broadly, one aspect of your research on education has been around improving equity in learning outcomes. And so what is the the general problem here and how have you tackled it? And I have in mind, uh, I think it might be the exact same paper, but a paper of yours based on a, a calculus-based physics course intervention. But I imagine that this might be a problem, this equity problem might be more novel historically because the university is attracting people that weren't able to go beforehand earlier. Uh, yeah, although I'm, I'm suspecting it's not all that new, really. Uh, I think, I think really universities are just paying more attention to it than they used to, but, yeah. but I think we've always had this with a big distribution of how well students were doing and people were just willing to, ignore the bottom half and decide they just weren't that talented enough. But yeah, so we're, we're sort of looking at, at the teaching and thinking about, okay, how do we really match the, the curriculum and the pace to the student background as, and for all the students, not just the ones who had the most privileged education before then. And, and so that's a big part of what we're trying to do. The other thing is though we, in, in this particular case, we also focused a lot more on the detailed problem solving process. And we, we look at, in our research, we look at the, the way scientists solve problems by making a set of decisions. And so we would have the students actually have to practice explicitly making these problem solving decisions and we think sort of providing that structure gives them an extra boost uh, that they need to kind of help catch up 
they have had weak background mm. before that. Yeah, when I was in undergraduate, I swiftly learned that if I wanted to do well in my math courses, I should not pay any attention in the, I should just not go to the lectures, these bigger lectures. The best thing I could do was do problems from the textbook, just spend the time doing that. And I would do much better on the exams. But tell me if I've, if I'm capturing your attitude correctly here, but my understanding is that beyond your personal experience, based on the research, you believe that to be a good scientist or engineer, you've got to learn to solve realistic problems and that this is more important than the rote memorization often practiced in standard STEM coursework. And if this is if this is accurate, then not only does this approach that you've just been describing help with the equity issues, it should also improve outcomes for all students beyond the classroom. Uh, even those students who performed best before the intervention, because they're getting better preparation for being scientists. Yeah, that's exactly what I believe. And we we have, especially with this this work we've done, where we really understand the the science and really in engineering problem solving process that we can make students learn to be much more expert-like in the way they tackle problems by really focusing very explicitly on on doing that in their class in their course activities mm. well i cut you off from answering this a few minutes ago but a another major problem with the teaching establishment as it currently operates is that teachers' success, while, while their research is very well documented uh, and measured, their, their teaching success is not reliably or usefully evaluated. So what are the, the practices for this like now as they stand? And then how do you think they can be overhauled to better reflect, I, I mean, not just whether students had positive outcomes, but also whether the teachers were in fact effective with the methodology they used. So, I mean, the, the overwhelmingly pervasive way teaching is evaluated is by student course evaluations, where the students, the end of the course, students are given a survey that they fill out on how they like the teaching. And these the student evaluations are known to have tremendous flaws uh, in them and I, I could go on on and on about all of them but the so, some of the most important are they're they're quite biased and so for example if you're a, a minority or a woman teaching physics you'll there's some good studies showing you'll be ranked much lower than a white male uh, teaching the same subject. And so that's already a, a real problem. But also, you know, the, the thing you care about most is how much students actually learn in a class. And, you know, and so they often have some question that that asks something to that effect. And but if you stop to think about what do you need to what do you need to know to give a good answer to how much you learned in a class, you really need to know how much you could have learned that you didn't, <laughs> and uh, you know, and to to know how good the course was. And nobody can know that, and so it just shows you that they're they're just fundamentally flawed in what they measure, and they also never capture i mean we have all this research on these different teaching methods that show much better student outcomes and the student evaluations don't capture that the use of better teaching practices at all because students just aren't aware of the effects there as well so so it's a real problem that those are the only way <laughs> way people have to evaluate and so what I think is we need evaluation systems that capture much more about 
what actual practices the faculty are using in their teaching, in their courses. And so we tried to develop some tools to actually collect that data. And there's actually a, a project that my wife and I sponsored actually for the money we got from a prize. Uh, the AAU, the American Association of Universities, which is sort of the 70 or so top research universities, they have a, a STEM initiative to try and improve STEM teaching. And as part of that, then we sponsored this for, they had a competition to have demonstration projects of departments actually developing and demonstrating different and more effective ways to actually evaluate teaching. So we're sort of seeing how that works because I think, you know, right now lots of people realize there's a problem, but nobody really knows how to do it better or right. And so we're hoping out of this demonstration project there will come some useful information. The new sorts of measurements or different sorts of measurements you just described, like what methods were used, one major positive of that is that they're objective and you would expect that the students will agree on this. Whereas with the student course evaluations as they stand, and I've taken, I've done many of them, those questions are not asked. But you mentioned that people will likely rate their experience in a class as a physics class as much less if or much worse if it's taught by a woman or a minority but the pro i mean that's a glaring issue but another dimension of this problem is that there is so much noise because if there are a hundred students in the class one student might give the the faculty high rating because they find them attractive one person might give them a low rating because they saw on the internet that their professor has X political view that they don't agree with. There are just so many different things that are going to interfere with whether or not the evaluations are actually measuring what is supposed to be measured. Yeah. And that's, that's very true. And in fact, if anybody teaches a large course, you know that the student evaluations are almost impossible for giving you any guidance on what to do better because they're just, there's always some students that, you know, in a big class, there's always some students who love it, some students who hate it, a lot of students in between, and they're just all over the place. And so there's no, no clear signal there at all about how to improve even. And, and an evaluation system that doesn't show you how to improve is pretty worthless. I know somebody who's a professor and they mentioned of a famous actress innocuously in the course of a lecture. And some student in the course said, oh, she's beautiful. And somebody else in their course evaluation gave the professor very low marks for allowing uh, women to be objectified in the course. And from our perspective, that is not something that really <laughs> should one, it, it might impact this person's career, but two, it's not a measurement of how well the the course was taught. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, one, one can go on all day with examples from <laughs> problems with student course evaluations. Mm -hmm. But for now, let's run through a case scenario. So say College X has an intro introductory physics course that they want to improve because the students don't seem to be mastering the material. What are, I mean, the basic steps that the department should be taking to restructure this class? Um, I'm just trying to think because I've been in many different situations <laughs> so, uh, sort of related to this. But I mean, the, the first thing is that people need to realize, okay, there's research on this. You don't have to reinvent everything. There are people who have studied this and developed different ways to teach and they've published on it and you should go out and start getting those and copying them and, and particularly looking at the ideas of how to implement this so-called active learning in, in the class setting. And, you know, we have, 
my group has various papers on it, but lots of other people do too. And so that that's really the the first way to start. Uh, you know, you don't have to build and, everything from the ground up. That's right. And you know, the other the other thing that's a little harder, but if people can go and see, watch how a class like this is taught, that's really helpful to them. And and that's in the SEI, that's what we found was really a really an important aspect of once you we had sort of trained people to work with faculty to adopt these methods, but then we had other faculty come and watch them and that was really helpful in other faculty of learning how to do it, but also even more important, seeing how much more fun it was to teach that way, because uh, the students are much more engaged and and come to class more and and just makes it more rewarding. And so the there's really multiple values of having people sit in on classes that are being taught this way and and appreciate it. More. Yeah, you, you just alluded to something, uh, one intervention that I found very compelling while reading because it had never occurred to me before. And that's the science education specialist, this position, the SES, since we're using, we've been using uh, acronyms. So the idea that a department should employ people whose specialization is education so that they can help faculty teach better. You would think that it, that should have occurred to me before that professors are not taught how to teach. Well, I mean, I guess you, you go to a couple of things, a couple of little seminars before you start TAing. But then once you arrive at a university, they just throw you into a class. And as we were discussing, as I was commending you for the way that you explain certain things, you or we pointed out that professors are trained to be researchers. They're not, they're often not trained to teach. Yeah. And so we had these, these science education specialists who were, and there's lots of people are actually trying to copy that, that approach of getting these sort of postdoc level people into departments to work with faculty to teach and, one of the the biggest problems with that is actually the training of those people because I ran a program where we trained them, but it's very hard to find people coming in with that level of training and and so that's been the limitation on other other institutions. but I do know that that is a a model that has attracted interest hmm. well as we as we look toward uh, finishing up, there are a couple, a couple questions that I had. So were there any major surprises in the SEI or that have otherwise come up in your research? Like, so maybe changes that you expected to have a dramatic effect on educational outcomes, but that were found to be ineffective at best, or maybe even counterproductive at worst or, or anything like this? Uh, yeah, there were a, a few surprises. Uh, I would say the one was that I had started out thinking that it would make sense to just start making changes at the introductory course level and then sort of move up through the, through the, the ladder of courses. And what I realized was, no, it was actually, that didn't really work, that it was much more important to just find faculty who were interested and receptive in making change and sort of whatever course they were going to be teaching, <laughs> help them to do it. And then, and then just build up more and more faculty who are teaching differently that way. Uh, so that was kind of one, I'd say mistake that I, I made, uh, in, in doing this. Um, uh, one thing that, I, another mistake, which it was just the level of training of these SES is that it need to be more extensive and more formal than I had uh, first appreciated. Um, the, 
somewhat surprising was to see, as I worked with a lot of different departments, how different departments were in terms of how just how they functioned, their attitudes about teaching and who and why the taught. And, you know, in the same institution, you just have adjacent science departments that are just behaving completely differently. <laughs> and so that was that was a, an interesting curiosity to to encounter. Uh, one of the one of the other surprises which was a good surprise was this idea of how uh the a big incentive to faculty to change their teaching was because it was so much more enjoyable to teach using these you know active learning research-based methods than it was to lecture and that once people saw how it could actually be done and why it was more enjoyable they that really helped them change. And once they did change, they didn't want to go back because of that. And so that was a place where in some ways that was kind of the biggest incentive we had. And, you know, you could argue it wasn't formal at all. It was completely internal, but it still was, it was a pleasant surprise at how important and valuable that was. Uh, Certainly a serendipitous, discovery and maybe you could explain more like why why is it more fun to teach in this way than it is to lecture because i i imagine before you answer maybe this is different for some some professors but some professors like lecturing it's sort of like a mini perform i mean other people are just sort of standing at the podium and reading and i'm sure that that's boring but what makes this type of teaching more enjoyable yeah so first that there are some faculty who see lecturing as performance and that love doing it. And they're the hardest to get to change uh, in in my experience. But the others, what they see as more enjoyable is you're much more directly engaged with the students. So when you're lecturing, you just see all these blank faces out there and maybe, you know, You wonder how many of them are paying any attention and how many of them are learning and you really don't have much idea at all and you might have a few questions but never very many and they're half the time their students just want to show off not really having anything useful the other half the time they just want to know if it's going to be on the exam or something Mm -hmm. Uh, whereas when you're teaching the way i've talked about so First, the students are highly engaged, you know, they're working on figuring out problems and, you know, that so the students are more, more involved, but because they're, and, and you're going around and monitoring how the individual students are, are doing, you're listening to convert their conversations about the subject. So, you know, so much more about how they're thinking about it and they're asking you many more questions you're getting involved so you're sort of much more directly linked to their thinking and learning and and you know that's just more satisfying because you sort of know you're you're helping teach them (laughs) really much more directly Uh, but then also they're asked because they are more engaged They're they tend to ask many more questions and much deeper questions about the subject. And so you it's you're it's calling on your expertise in the field really more and using that. And and so I think, you know, and then, as I say, also they're coming to class uh, much, much more than they were in the lecture because partly because you have to be there, but partly because the class is just much more valuable to them. So those are kind of all the reasons that it's just a more rewarding experience for the faculty. Hmm. Well, the last thing I'll ask, I mean, most of our discussion, I mean, all of our discussion thus far in the second half of this conversation has centered around science education and the examples we've discussed were particularly about physics education. And I'm wondering if what was found in the SEI and your other research endeavors uh, 
that were have been explicitly tested in science education can be replicated in other areas of the university, like English or philosophy or mathematics. Or, I mean, mathematics as a STEM field is quite close to physics, but whether or not this problem-solving approach, some of the other things we've discussed are applicable there. Yeah, so so math compared to the science department is kind of less receptive and done less work, but there has been some work done there and we had it in the SEI at UBC. And so I'm confident that this applies very much to, to math, just the same ideas. Uh, as you get more broad, broader than that, I'm pretty confident the social sciences that are would also be very much the same. And there's a little bit of research done in, in those areas, economics and and so on. Uh, once you get out to the humanities and English, I mean, I personally think that if you sort of break down the, the field into the ideas of the kind of decisions that experts make in their subject and the kind of thinking they have to do, that you'd be much better off and you'd get better results if you had students actually practicing the, that kind of thinking. Uh, but the, in my experience, the faculty in these areas are just a very long ways from considering this and, you know, both listening to some scientists tell them how to teach, but even thinking that you can do research on teaching and learning uh, is seems to be really such a foreign concept to them that it seems like they're very long ways from adopting these ideas. But I think, I, I do think we can trace a lot of these back to very basic processes of how how experts in a subject think and how you develop that thinking to enough to be pretty confident that it would apply quite generally. Yeah, what it sounds like to me and what makes perfect sense is that rather than lecturing in, say, an English department, Ideally, one, you would have smaller class sizes, but that probably helps pretty much everywhere. But a course would center around close readings of passages uh, with, say, a professor and 10 students and talking about analyzing it. Or in philosophy, reading papers and analyzing them in the moment or construct. Yeah, because, I, you know, I, I think if you look at, at really what are the whether the cognitive steps involved in close reading, for example, you know, it involves a certain number of decisions and reasoning processes, which you can make quite explicit. And then, and that means you can have students really practice doing them, you know, and getting feedback on that in the same way we do on these other subjects. Hmm. Well, uh, Carl, a, 20-some year belated congratulations on the Nobel Prize. This conversation has been, I think, in both, both topics we've covered, the BECs and the education, have been quite comprehensive, though not exhaustive, but both at just the right level. And I am so thankful that you took the time to talk to me about your work. So thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. It's been a pleasure. Hold on. If you haven't subscribed, liked, commented, or reviewed, that would be so helpful. And if you haven't yet, you could also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Robinson Airhome.